at his lecture dedicated to his memory. And Levin's contribution to imperialist, imperial study, European empire, making and unmaking of Russian empire, Russia against Napoleon, all these works are, have achieved great eminence. And as I was saying, that the kind of association that the present speaker Dominic had with Hari, before he came to us in Calcutta, in Cambridge, and as a student of Christ Church, makes him perhaps the best choice for us to give us this, the first lecture dedicated to his memory. And with these words, recalling my 40 years association with the man who has just disappeared from our life, I invite Dominic Levin, who may be feeling the same way because of a longer association with Professor Vasudevat to present the lecture dedicated to the memory of Hari Vasudevan. Thank you. Dominic Levin. Thank you very much. I hope that my voice is coming across at the right volume. If not, please tell me. And of course, huge thanks to the university and to Hari's family for making this lecture possible and allowing me in a very small way uh, to pay a tribute to someone I always thought of as one of my oldest and closest and dearest friends. Harry and I studied history together at Christ's College in Cambridge in 1970 to 1973. He was my closest friend in the college. We then both went on to do PhDs in the late imperial period of Russian history. So we were both close friends and colleagues in a relatively narrow space. Poor Harry always despaired of my interest in monarchies of various shapes and sizes. I don't know what he would have made of this talk. I'm sure he would have greeted it with his normal beautifully sceptical, but kindly intelligence and humour. But in any event, uh, I am deeply grateful to be allowed to give this lecture as a very small tribute to a very old and dear friend. The book I'm talking about notionally has the title Close to Heaven, The Emperor in World History. And I handed in a sort of first draft last week. I've been working on it for the last six years, but in a sense for the whole of my academic life. It is a study of a job, and above all of the people who did that job, across the whole world, with the exception, to be honest, of pre-16th century Americas but across all the millennia as well. It is inevitably, therefore, a book of enormous scale and, in a way, complexity. And at the centre of that book, there is a tension. To write something even remotely sensible on a subject of this scale, you require concepts, you require comparisons, you require generalisations, you require structure. But a core element of the book, in fact, you could say the core element, is a study of human beings. The human individual is difficult to generalize about. You can, up to a point, generalize about types of human being. You can, to some extent, generalize about dynastic traditions of monarchy and of what the, the job entails. But in the end, 
at the center of things there is the individual and the individual is not easy to generalize about so there is this absolutely deliberate and i think useful tension at the center of the book there if you like is one way of looking at it um, and certainly the way that i sometimes explained what i was up to to my scientist colleagues fellows of trinity college on high table when they asked me what i was doing and i said that in a sort of sense i was doing the same as they were doing often they would subject materials to extreme heat extreme cold and in a sort of sense i was doing the same to human beings being an emperor was in a sense to subject the human being to strains which the human frame is not designed to to sustain uh if you were going to do this job properly uh you were going to be something quite exceptional since the great majority of the people i studied were hereditary monarchs in the nature of things most of them were not exceptional so there is again a sort of tension one way in rather more academic terms that one could see this book uh, is as a sort of look into the old question of structure against agency in one sense these emperors seemed at least on the outside to be as powerful as a human being could be and yet the more perceptive and aware and successful of them actually always recognize the enormous limitations and constraints on their power i do not at all think of biography as a sort of illustration to a text in this room in this book it isn't like that i think of it much more to put things in slightly pretentious terms as the precious jewels which are woven into a, a wonderful persian imperial carpet which you hang on the wall to look at all right to come a bit more down to earth clearly this subject is far too much for a book let alone for a one-hour lecture so all i will be able to do is give a very brief overview above all stressing what i'm trying to do and some of my conclusions in a way this is a summary of my first chapter which a bit of with a bit of the afterword tacked on the first chapter attempts to make it a bit easier for a reader to steer his or her way through this extraordinary sort of history of the world if you like and one can to some extent do that because for all the enormous differences there is a sort of map there is common terrain emperors to some extent face similar challenges to some extent you compare can compare their strategies and their tactics to some extent i think there are probably four key pillars of the book one is simply the most banal element in it emperors were human beings therefore they inevitably shared certain common human qualities challenges dilemmas etc emperors were by definition leaders and that's the second pillar and they were political leaders above all but they were not just humans or political leaders they were hereditary monarchs and hereditary monarchy with all its peculiarities is the third of the four pillars and then the fourth pillar is empire these were not just ordinary monarchs they were kings of kings they were emperors and governing an empire again differed enormously from which empire which era etc but there were certain commonalities which allows one to talk about empire as a specific type of polity and therefore there were also specific challenges as regards trying to rule one of these monstrous political systems all right to say something about the human being my first pillar an obvious point is the life cycle 
you know, childhood in human beings lasts a long time. Children need protection, they need guidance. And that is true also of adolescents. Then you have the problem of usually the young male, a few of my heroes are females, but usually the young male growing up and trying to assert himself. And then you have the vulnerabilities and the fading energies and the pessimism of old age. And all of these things, which all of us, at least most of the people I see looking at me from the screen are of my age, we've all experienced that in ourselves and others. And emperors experienced it. But of course, if you were not just a human, but also an emperor, there were specific implications. The vulnerability of monarchy, when the monarch is a child, uh, is something you find everywhere from Shakespeare to the study of any political system by a historian. Monarchies during regencies, empires during regencies, were always that bit more vulnerable. Sometimes if you were doing dealing with new and insecure dynasties, a child on the throne was fatal. Many emperors, as they grew up, as they became young men, sought to assert themselves. And like most of the young men we've ever come across, including ourselves, they sometimes did that more successfully than other times. So again, uh, that particular part of an human being's life has its specific reality when you're talking about hereditary monarchy and old age even more i think if you're looking at the causes for the collapse what you might describe as the contingent causes although old age could also be described as a structural cause more of my dynasties collapsed or at least were fatally weakened as the monarch aged, lost his energy, lost his willpower, became more stubborn, lost the older advisors and even relatives to whom he was accustomed to listen. That often was a cause of crisis, even without coming on to something I will talk about in more detail, which is succession and all the problems it threw up. And then, of course, apart from the human life cycle, you simply have human nature. You know, as a human being, an emperor needed food, he needed sleep, he needed sex. We are sociable animals, and emperors very often needed something you might describe as a friend, or many friends. And then you come to the issue of whether it was actually possible to be an emperor and have what you and I would mostly think of as friends. Many of the tutors, of the heirs to imperial thrones, for instance, warned them that they must never expect to have any genuine friends. Because there were no other human beings, with the possible exception of the women in their family, with whom they could operate on a level of genuine, unconstrained human affection and even a sort of, not equality, but sure balance. You have a certain type of insecure youngish emperor who yearns for company, yearns in a sense for friendship, but is deeply insecure about his own status and intelligence, whatever, and therefore both encourages friendship and cuts down anyone who then tries to behave like a friend. So you have these variations, these complications, even more. Uh, interesting in inverted commas. I mean, friends become favourites, and there is a vast literature on the role of the favourite, for instance, in 16th or 17th century Europe, and just to what extent the favourite, in other words, a sort of prime minister, chief minister, is or is not also a friend. And all the insecurities and the confusions the mixed role can cause. It, even more is the search for sex and even worse for love. A uh, wonderful piece in Louis XIV's memoirs, which are really his instructions to his son, which basically tells his son under no circumstances whatsoever to allow any friend or favourite to block up the channels of information in particular, but also patronage, on which royal power depends. But if friends were dangerous, mistresses were the most dangerous thing of all. 
because of the natural craftiness of the female. And of course, the particular hold of a woman whom you loved on your emotions, your judgment, your whom you chose as your friends, etc, etc, etc. Now, this is not an argument for saying that human nature is a constant, let alone saying that the human mind is a constant. Of course it isn't. Of course it isn't. You know, the last, the only emperor still living on Earth is the emperor of Japan. The Japanese monarchy is fascinating because it is not just in genealogical terms, but also in terms of eras, the most ancient, or certainly of the major monarchies in today's world. It goes back to the era before the great salvation religions, before even Buddhism, really. Back to the world of animism. And animism in its different incarnations has its own sense of where you stand in the great scheme of things. It is rooting human beings in nature, in the cosmos, etc. It is, in a sense, answering up to a point the questions which even 3,000 years ago some of my emperors can be seen to have been asking themselves. What's life about? What are the stars doing up there? Why am I going to die? It's not right that I should die. Why is it that reproduction happens and the flowers bloom? What about the sun and fire? You know, these kind of questions are answered to various degrees by the various animist religions, including what one might inaccurately describe as ancient Shinto. Then along come the salvation religions, and they provide the great universal religions, and they provide sort of answers, or at least they you know, narrow the field as regards the answers to those fundamental questions of human existence. And the great emperors do associate themselves, with very few exceptions in time, with one or sometimes more than one in interesting cases of these great universal religions. But it's interesting to note that even the monotheistic imperial monarchies, in other words, the Christian and Islamic ones, which are the fiercest on this subject of banishing animism and all the old pagan gods, <clears throat> even they, down to the 16th century, still accept that there may be a special place for astrology, that it may just be that the stars are another way in which God presents his plan to, to humans, if only we could see what was going on. Interestingly, Philip II of Spain in the 16th century, a Catholic dogmatic monarch, if ever there was one, still believes in astrology, as even more determinedly, of course, do his cousins in the, the junior Austrian Habsburg line of the Habsburg dynasty. Even Erasmus, you know, at the very front of European scholarship, concedes that the stars may offer an autonomous, separate understanding of God's plan for the cosmos and for humans. It's really only the scientific revolution and then the Enlightenment which kicked that out to the margins, uh, to the Daily Mail and such. So you get a, a curious combination when you're trying to make comparisons. I like a comparison between Emperor Julian of the Roman Empire, which is four, late fourth, well, mid fourth century, uh, common era, and the Emperor Joseph II, the Holy Roman Emperor Joseph II, the Habsburg Emperor, late 18th century. In many ways, it's a deeply silly comparison. But there are some things in common when you're talking both about human types and about political profiles as well, in a way. Both Julian and Joseph were intelligent, thoughtful people, well-versed in the sort of intellectual text, the philosophy of the day. They were impatient men, and they could at times tend to hysteria. And they are, in a sense, a study of what the pressures of top office, the emperorship, do to sensitive human beings. Interestingly, also, they can be compared because unlike most hereditary monarchs, most hereditary emperors, 
they came to the throne with a very determined program for domestic reform and a radical one. Julian is attempting to turn back the clock, attempting to repudiate his dynastic founder, the Emperor Constantine, and repudiate the alliance between the Roman imperial state and Christianity. Joseph II comes to the throne, 1765 and 1780, as, as regards Seoul rule, absolutely determined to impose on his empire a radical enlightenment reform program. And you could argue that both men failed as much as anything because at the same time as trying to push radical domestic reform, they also engaged on an adventurous foreign policy which led to disaster because, well, in the most obvious sense of Julius ter Julian's terms, he was killed on campaign. But in both cases as well, because it diverted resources, uh, political resources as much as anything, from his domestic program. So you get these kind of comparisons. And yet, of course, if you're talking about the mentality of mentality, meaning the values, the ideas of the two emperors, they are divided by a chasm. Julian is a product of ancient Greek theology is the wrong word. Philosophy is better. The Greek gods, you know, the lot. Joseph is a product of enlightenment, radical utilitarianism rational utilitarianism completely different world orders you know so you have this mixture of there are certain ways in which you can compare certain ways in which it's ridiculous to do so as regards my second pillar the leader again uh you know in some ways you can make comparisons some of the literature which you get out of usually the business schools on leadership is valuable, particularly the books which are looking above all at political leadership. Uh, if you read the autobiography, for instance, of Barack Obama, or if you read some good biographies, for instance, by David Runciman of, you know, contemporary political leaders, some things immediately strike a chord. You know, when Barack Obama talks about the loneliness of power, or when he talks about the fact that there are no true friends in Washington. Or when he talks about the extent to which success or failure in top leadership is owed to luck. I mean, this is Machiavelli, but it's also something which all my more perceptive emperors would have said, which Louis XIV does say, uh, as indeed to some extent as Tang Taizong in the early 7th seven, century. Uh, it, it's just in the nature of politics, you know, and anyone who's been there. Again, uh, very interesting. And you get this actually even, well, you get it across the board. Uh, more interestingly from Louis XIV, more interestingly from Tang Taizong than actually from Machiavelli. Despite the title of that book, The Prince, Machiavelli is a very bad guide in many ways uh, to what it meant to be the heir and the ruler of a well-established dynastic empire. His is a handbook essentially for Al Capone or for Italian bandit princes of the 16th century. This is not hereditary, deeply established monarchy. As indeed Machiavelli himself more or less says, he says on a number of occasions in The Prince, actually what I'm saying is not true if you come from a well-established hereditary dynasty. But, you know, Louis the, Louis the 14th, for instance, is almost echoed by Barack Obama. Uh, when Obama writes, you've got to try and encourage every kind of different view from your advisors. If you, you've got to gather them together so you can hear the different views, be careful always to speak last. If you speak early or your views are well known, you can rely on the fact that most people will tell you what they think you want to hear. Well, if that's true of a contemporary American president uh, and actually a decent and intelligent one like Obama, how much truer for an emperor with all the status that you know, his office had? So Louis XIV tells his son, be very careful to listen much more than you talk. Be very careful 
to encourage and reward people who speak their mind and tell you things which they know you do not want to hear. Because unless you do that with great stress and determination, you will simply be surrounded by people who tell you what they think you want to hear, because you are the source of their power, but also of patronage. And interspersed in this book, you know, I do look at key events, such as the coming of the French Revolution, such as the coming of the First World War. Though also, you know, the origins of Islam, God only knows what else. But just to hone in on July 1914, which I do know a bit about, because I've written two books around the subject. You know, it's often asked why it was that even in comparison to the Austrian and Russian monarchies, which are taken to be more backward and traditional usually, the German one in that July 1914 simply never actually holds what you could describe as a council meeting in which the emperor presides over a meeting of his key military, civil, diplomatic and naval experts to try and thrash out a policy. It's grossly irresponsible the way they do and don't act. But actually, if you know about the personality of the last German emperor, and you've read Louis XIV, and you've read Tang Taizong, you realise it would have made no difference. Because William II was absolutely notorious for the fact that he never listened and couldn't stop talking. That he was, as his dearest and closest friend and advisor, Philip Eulenberg said, a lovely child but deeply sensitive, took every criticism as a personal affront, to an almost you know, ridiculous degree, um, was full and bumptious about his power and his superiority and his status. Yet combine that, and indeed the two were completely intertwined into a deep personal insecurity and a longing for approbation and approval. You know, if w William II blustered and shouted, and said that, you know, this was going to end up in war, probably. His general, his top military advisors didn't take him seriously because he's done it so often before. He always blustered and shouted. They didn't bother to say anything different because William never put up with anyone who actually said, no, you're talking nonsense. But they took it for granted he'd back off when the crisis really came because deep inside he was a rather timid man. And of course, as the crisis built up towards the end of July 1914, he did try and run away did try and draw back, but by then it was too late. He'd set off the bureaucratic machinery and he couldn't stop it, or at least he couldn't stop it except at a price which would have been very dangerous for him and his regime. So his advisors actually sabotaged him to some extent. So again, you know, yes, there are absolutely specific uh, contexts in July 1914. Yes, the world of high imperialism is a different world to that of Louis XIV and that of Tang Taizong, or of Charles V. It's not different in every ways, and the human beings who sit around a table and decide the fate of empires have the human qualities or lack thereof, and small groups of five people chaired by one person who has far superior status have certain commonalities as well as indeed, despairingly, they will if it comes to nuclear war in the future. You know, it will not be that different. All right, so that, you know, is what I'll say about my second pillar, um, leaders. Third pillar is hereditary monarchy, and that deserves one or two preliminary comments. I mean, the basic point about hereditary monarchy as a means to doing what most of ancient, certainly political thought, believed was the key issue in politics, choosing virtuous and effective leaders. Well, you know, you don't need much imagination, sense, common sense, to realise that hereditary monarchy is an extremely inadequate, grossly inadequate way of doing that. So then you have the question, if not just the Greeks, but also ancient Chinese, and indeed in many ways also the Arthur Shastra, if all of them could see pretty easily that hereditary monarchy was a pretty 
foolish way of choosing the best man to rule a country. Why is it that sacred hereditary monarchy was overwhelmingly the dominant form of political leadership and of polity from ancient times, certainly from the second millennium, I would say, uh, before the common era, down certainly to the 19th century and surviving in much of the world into the 20th century as well. And I think there are a number of basic reasons and you can't really understand what I'm trying to study unless you take them on board. The first is simply that to varying degrees, much of political theory and certainly much of, uh, you know, what you might describe as somewhere between theory and practice before the modern era uh, was an offshoot of theology. Uh, it was very widely believed that things happened on earth either because heaven actually decided that they should happen or that at least it allowed them to happen. There was a sense of, you know, our realm, the, the human realm and, and the heavens being part of a single order. Uh, monarchs, all lasting dynasties, were sacred. In one form or another, they were intermediaries between human beings and heaven, either as the deputies of some version of Godhead, or you know, people who performed rituals which stopped the heavens from falling. I mean, there obviously is a distinction between monotheism, Buddhism, and then out to Confucianism. There is also certainly in the Christian and Islamic tradition the sense that since God created human beings, what you might describe as natural law must also to some extent be divine law. God created us, so if things are natural to us, they are to an extent his creation. Well, what was more natural in all pre-modern societies than heredity? The carpenter succeeded the carpenter's father. Uh, the same was true in almost all areas of social and economic life. Natural, therefore, in the sense that father should succeed, be succeeded by son on a throne. More basically as well, there is the sense with monarchy and in a sense coincides uh, the idea that without a powerful monarch society will disintegrate because you need a powerful arbiter both to sort out domestic strife and to defend the community against its foreign threats enemies and since again that is essential a powerful hereditary monarchy is essential if human society is to survive, that is something which is not just pragmatically necessary, but must be divinely ordained. Because God created human beings and therefore created human societies and therefore also created the needs they had for hereditary monarchs. But beyond that, with all, almost all, well, all, of course, hereditary monarchies, but almost all uh, pre modern societies since really quite early times, you have a fundamental belief that the mass of the population is uneducated, it's necessarily absorbed in scraping a living, it is irrational and subject to uh, emotion much more than any kind of movement of the mind, and it is also to varying degrees sinful or even wicked, and that therefore only a strong power standing above can stop human beings tearing each other to bits. <clears throat> Again, you'll get this universally uh, across much of the... I mean, the Arthur Shastra is the, you know, Kautilya is probably the most dripping uh, statement of this, but it would be repeated time and time again in all the emperor's own statements about humanity. And it isn't just a question of the masses. You can turn it round. Uh, at least as great a threat to society is conceived to be civil war among the elites, not least civil wars to seize power 
and absorb the material benefits of power. And in that sense, monarchy can often, absolute monarchy, can often have a strong popular support as well. The greatest victims of civil war among the elites or foreign invasion or the collapse of infrastructure caused by foreign elites or invasion are the mass of the population. So you will very often have strong support to the extent that one can gauge these things for a powerful monarch, the bandit in chief who will keep all the other bandits in order. So you will only pay one lot of taxes instead of 54 and you know which tax, etc. I mean, all rather obvious. The Greeks are a semi-exception to the rule that ancient political thought is mostly a variation on the theme of sacred monarchy. Aristotle, the obvious example of someone who is rather interestingly disposed towards what you might describe as democracy. Um, and it's in a way true also to think of Aristotle as part of the 1990s Washington consensus, to put things in silly terms. He does, after all, say that once you have enough rational, and he actually says middle class men, uh, it's not just that you can have a democracy, but that democracy is the only form of government which really is possible with such a population. But there again, Aristotle does say that democracy is only credible in medium-sized city-states. Uh, that's all he's interested in, and he takes it for granted that if you move into the larger political units, uh, then there's no chance of democracy. I'll come back to this if I have time, but scale is precisely one of the themes which runs through this book. You know, the movement from the city-state, as Montesquieu put it, unable to defend itself up to the European scale monarchy, of which he thought France was the perfect embodiment. That medium scale monarchy with Britain also acquiring one of the key residual advantages of the city state, which is management of public debt. And then in the second half of the 19th century with globalization and the rise of the United States, the realization that the European medium sized monarchy, the France or the Britain, was not enough to be a great power in the 20th century, and you needed empire. And that, after all, is the reality of the world we still live in. The nation provides solidarity and legitimacy, but only imperial scale makes you a significant player on the world stage. And Barack Obama, again in his memoirs, writing about how when you actually come to govern, a democracy of the scale of the United States, you realize that there is virtually nothing you can achieve. And that is deeply frightening when you look at the fact that actually government now, and particularly the government of the superpowers, has got to act, or the climate crisis is going to destroy us all, or at least destroy anything decent that we might hope for our children and grandchildren. So scale is very much an issue. But in a sort of way, Greek ancient political thought is fascinating because of its variety um, and against Aristotle you can put Plato and his idea of the guardian and of the philosopher king and actually the political tradition which most perfectly and consistently embody, embodies the platonic view of politics I think is the Confucian bureaucracy and the Confucian sage monarch or the Confucian legalist sage monarch uh, and actually, in a sort of curious kind of way, China against the United States is Aristotle against Plato, with what you might describe as a few hundred years of American democracy as a sort of practical guide to what democracy might mean in, mean in practice, and Chinese Neo-Confucian uh, authoritarianism as a variation on the Platonic theme in practice rather than glorious theory. All right, that's... Um, sort of preliminary, rather too lengthy remarks, specifics of hereditary monarchy, many inevitably, but succession is one you have to hone in, focus in on. And that, in a sense, is true of any political system. Any political system is faced with that very difficult problem of how you transfer power from one power holder to another, how you transfer it across the generations. 
In democracies, politicians and political observers obsess about elections. And we all know that there are vast differences between presidentialism and uh, prime minister-based systems, cabinet-based systems, that there are vast differences within non-presidential systems as regards electoral rules. And, you know, I don't need to tell any of you that different kinds of systems produce different types of political conflicts and outcomes. Well, the same was true of hereditary monarchy. The principle was biological but there were many variations on succession in hereditary monarchies in general and hereditary imperial monarchies in particular. At the two extremes, you really have Europe at one end and the steppe, the nomads of the steppe on the other. Europe, strict male primogeniture increasingly prevails from at least the 12th century, at least. Um, and when I say strict male primogeniture, I also, of course, remind you that that is within the context of Christian monogamy and of the church and the aristocracies increasing insistence on ruling out illegitimate children, sons from inheritance. That produces a system of succession which is, in one sense, absolutely stable, in the sense everybody knows who the heir is, to an extent, it cuts out succession struggles, but among other things, it makes it inevitable that you're sometimes going to have children and you're often going to have incompetence on the throne. So you have to build institutions and conventions to cope with that. Right at the other end of the scale, you have the step where basically the sons and often the uncles and cousins fight it out. Again, um, you know, for succession. Uh, and any attempt to limit succession within the world of the steppe nomads is seen as deeply unjust. Sovereignty is shared within the males of the dynasty. You get practical variations of that, for instance, with the Ottomans and the Mughals, to both of whom I devote a chapter in this book. In both cases, you come down from a situation in which there's just a free-for-all to one in which the sons of the emperor fight it out to succeed and the basic rule there is that since fighting it out requires a considerable amount not just of military prowess but of political alliance building uh, you get men occupying the throne who are competent but of course at the expense of periodic civil war if the ottomans end up by abandoning that it is, I think, in contrast to the Mughals, because their geopolitical position is so much more vulnerable. You cannot afford civil war between the sons of the Sultan at a time when you've got the Safavids on your eastern frontier and the Habsburgs on your western one. It's simply too dangerous. The geopolitical position of the Mughals is much more secure, I think, uh, and therefore they can, to a greater extent, certainly until the 18th century, afford such struggles. That's my hunch, anyway. It's absolutely vital in this context whom an emperor marries or with, with what kind of woman he reproduces, produces heirs. Again, you have variants. Some dynasties, some cultures, the dynasty marries into the aristocratic elite. Many examples of this. The danger is that you give enormous extra status to aristocratic families and networks uh, which may anyway regard themselves as semi-equal to the monarch. At its extreme, that results in the state being taken over, even sometimes the dynasty usurped. One can find examples frequently, for instance, of that in China. Uh, right at the other end, there is the principle of marrying down. You deliberately marry lower down or reproduce lower down the social order in order to avoid boosting aristocratic pretensions and causing chaotic rivalries and jealousies within the aristocracy because of course any aristocratic family which marries the monarch uh, is hated by most other rival aristocratic families the russians before peter the great are an example of this they marry girls from respectable gentry families so as not to uh, 
give any of the Boyar family's excessive power, status, or ambition. And it's, it's useful, it works. These gentry families who are now in-laws can often be very useful and reliable allies to the Tsar. With Peter the Great and the Romanus intermarriage with European royalty, that ends. But it makes the career of Catherine the Great very fascinating because she never publicly married after the death of Peter the Third, her husband, though in fact she probably did marry her, her, her greatest lover, Pachonkin. Uh, but her two great lovers, Alof and then Pachonkin, play the role that a Tsar's in-laws played before Peter the Great. They are crucial allies. The Alofs hold down the guards in Petersburg in that vulnerable decade of the 1760s, Catherine's first decade on the throne. And Pachonkin runs the whole of South Russia for her, uh, subsequently. Uh, it has the added advantage, of course, that a woman's lover can occupy key executive positions in a way that a man's wife or mistress cannot. So it is fascinating. Right at the bottom, you have the Ottomans, uh, where at the apogee, in fact, for most of Ottoman history, uh, the Sultan never marries anyone. Uh, he produces sons via his harem. Any woman who produces a son by the Sultan is never allowed to produce another. A boy who, or man who comes to the throne after canistry, civil war ends in the early 17th century, kill, or late 16th century, kills all his half-brothers. So Ottoman court politics is a particularly vicious zero-sum game. You either hit the jackpot or you're dead. Uh, and that's an interesting variation. Then you have the European one, where you marry foreign princesses. And that raises the status of dynasties. It creates a sort of family network which gives Europe a sort of international society, international family flavor. It can end wars, but it has its dangers. And the most obvious is that, again, allied to Christian monogamy uh, and the anathema on illegitimate children succeeding, you have families intermarrying to such an extent that monarchs will have only, what is it, eight, eight great, you know, great grandparents. Well, one of the effects of that are biological. And the Habsburg family, which is the supreme embodiment of this principle, dies out in its senior branch in Spain in 1700 and dies out in its junior branch in 1740. And since the princesses of the House of Austria, like princesses elsewhere in Europe, marry foreign princes. When the male line dies out, it is heirs through the female line who have the right of succession. And therefore, to an extent which is inconceivable anywhere else in the world, dynastic marriage and dynastic succession crises end up in wars which convulse not just the whole of Europe, but by the 18th century, the whole of the world. It's, you know, therefore, I suppose, as in politics in general, uh, it's interesting to look at the various marriage strategies and to see the pluses and minuses of each of them. What that leads on naturally is to a discussion of the role of women in hereditary monarchy. In the monarchies I study, women are always subordinate to men with the very rare exceptions, the fascinating ones, where you do actually have a female ruler. One in China, for instance, Wu Zetian, none in France, uh, an interesting number in 18th century Europe, etc., etc. But although women are subordinate, uh, usually they are also very powerful uh, in hereditary monarchy. Uh, in a way, that is for the most obvious of all reasons. Crafty men have, over the millennia, discovered all sorts of crafty justifications for excluding women from armies, law courts, judiciaries, bureaucracies, you name it. But no one has yet been crafty enough to exclude women from the business of reproduction or family. 
and hereditary monarchy is family in power. Family is the central reality. The definition of dynasty is indeed family in power. A second key principle of hereditary monarchy is access to the monarch. Everything is geared to access. Proximity to the monarch is the supreme sign, not just of power, but also of status. If you look at court ceremony, if you look at court uniforms, it's all revolving around proximity to the monarch. Well, in the nature of things, if access to the monarch is every courtier's dream, sole access to the monarch uh, on his own for long periods is the sort of golden, whatever you want to call it, you know, the great prize. Well, of course, in the nature of things, it's the male monarch sexual partners who have that possibility to an extent that no one else can. You have to remember another principle of the politics of hereditary monarchy as well. Policy matters sometimes, patronage matters always. Women cannot hold executive office usually, but they can be wonderfully important and powerful patronage brokers, just as they are also very often the key marriage brokers. And remember, most hereditary monarchy family in power you're talking about networks of families between monarchy and aristocracy again it helps to explain the power of women in a sort of sense talking about female power is also a good insight onto structure versus agency the power of a christian empress or christian christian queen is in principle greater than that oh power might be the wrong word of even a chinese empress let alone an Ottoman concubine. Uh, the Christian monarch finds it very difficult to divorce and virtually impossible to change the line of succession. He has no chance, even had he wished to do so, of imposing an illegitimate child, illegitimate son, on the aristocracy as heir to the throne. So, you know, unlike a Chinese empress who can be divorced and in some dynasties her sons don't necessarily have priority for uh you know succession he's stronger than her he's obviously stronger than an ottoman concubine and yet and yet and yet in the end a woman's power depends more than anything else on the emotional and sexual hold she has on the monarch uh marie leshinska the wife of louis the 15th has uh, an unassailable status as queen of france her son will succeed if he outlives his father she has a little patronage of her own, genuinely independent. But nobody doubts that Madame de Pompadour is much more powerful as regards even policy, let alone patronage. So again, structure against agency. The most powerful women, and in many ways the most hated women, are very often those Christian female monarchs who monopolize their husbands. Uh, in other words, they, he is faithful to them, they control his emotional and sexual life. And that gives them tremendous power and makes them deeply hated. Add on to that the fact that they are almost by definition foreigners. And you begin to understand something of the syndrome of Henrietta Maria of England, Marie Antoinette of France, or the last empress of Russia, Alexandra. Of course, the fundamental point here is misogyny. Uh, you know, right back in the 13th century, the mother of St. Louis, Louis IX of France, the saintly Blanche of Castile, is denounced at the very birth of French, or more to the point, Parisian public opinion, as a whore who's having an affair with the papal legate um, and as someone who is stealing French funds in order to send them to her relatives in Castile. Uh, so there is deeply embedded in these traditions a very strong misogyny. There is also a sort of logic, though, to these attacks on the powerful queen. The basic point about being a hereditary monarch, and particularly a hereditary emperor, is that you need to have many of the qualities of a lion tamer. You are dealing with extremely arrogant, determined, aggressive, particularly aristocratic, political men. And you need the qualities of a life, a lion tamer to control them. If you can't even manage your wife, so the whisper goes, what chance? So you can understand just how much 
for Charles I or Louis the Sixteenth or Nicholas the Second are undermined by this constant whispering that it's actually his wife who is dominant. She runs the country because she runs her husband. That takes me to my fourth pillar, which is empire, and I'll have to go a tiny bit quicker. You know, I could spend the rest of this lecture and 30 more trying to define empire. There is actually no word or set of words which will adequately and with equal adequacy sum up the essential qualities of all the empires which we have seen over history. You know, the one which makes most sense, I think, as regards the European empires, which are at the front of most contemporary minds, uh, is political conquest and domination, economic exploitation, cultural hegemony. That, to some extent, works as regards the great nomadic, or ultimately nomadic dynasties, Mughals, Qing, Ottomans, uh, you know, you name it. Um, except when you come to culture, where very often you're actually dealing with the precise opposite, the cultural conquest of the conquerors by the conquered. In other words, the conquest of nomadic, semi-nomadic societies by the sedentary high cultures and civilizations they've conquered. Uh, and there, you know, you're looking not at theorists of imperialism, but even Khaldun uh, and thinkers of this sort. I think it is to some extent fair to say that words are inadequate, certainly when you're trying to define empire or understand empire, and even more perhaps understand emperors. There are moments when I think you need to bring in, I don't know how em empires, you need to imagine empires, you need to feel them, you will almost need to see them. Uh, and I must say sometimes, you know, particularly sitting on the Golden Horn, uh, in Constantinople, Istanbul, or, or standing in front of the Temple of Heaven, uh, where the Qing Dynasty emperors used to make their sacrifices, and to some extent the Ming before them. I sort of have a sort of almost intuition of elements which are at the core of empire, their power, their majesty, their beauty very often, uh, their overpowering qualities, their sense of history, their sense of being part of something universal and enormous. And in a way, that's also a reason for looking to biography, because biography is to an extent which is impossible in structural historical analysis, let alone political science. It is something which depends partly on empathy, on imagination, even on the senses. So, you know, there are, I think, these elements which need to be taken into account. Nevertheless, you know, words are mostly the best we have. Uh, and so I do try and explain that for me, empire means above all, firstly, enormous scale. Secondly, multi-ethnicity, king of kings, ruler of many peoples, but above all power, above all power. It seems to me that if you are not uh, the ruler of a dynasty and a polity which has had a big impact on at least a major region of the world for some period. You're not really worth calling an empire. Power, of course, comes in many, many aspects. It's by no means just military or political or economic. Uh, it's also cultural and ideological. Uh, and certainly the most important empires are the ones which embody and carry forward some great universal religion or some great civilization. Because at that point, you're talking not just about which polity or even which people will dominate a large section of the world, but actually which values will predominate. You know, the greatest of all nomadic empires, undoubtedly in terms of extent, extent of its rule, were the Mongols. And the Mongol Empire has left some traces, even in the contemporary world, not, I think, very important ones. Uh, the Eurasian steppe uh, is by far the greatest center of nomadic power. One has to remember that nomads in military terms were superior to sedentary civilizations from early in the first millennium before the common era down to probably the 1500s common era. In comparison to the Eurasian steppe, the Arabian desert is small. And, you know, the Arab conquests uh, in that sense were smaller scale in principle than the Mongol ones. 
And yet, because in the case of the Arabs, nomadic power is allied to one of the great universal religions, whereas you know, the impact of the Mongol Empire on the contemporary world is pretty debatable. Very obviously, the impact of the Arab Caliphate and the survival and spread of Islam is enormous. It's one of the key geopolitical factors in the contemporary world. So that gives you a sort of example about power. Power in the short run, power in the long run, types of power, you name it. Which brings me to my last significant section, which, as I say, I will be very brief. It's simply to state the obvious, that an emperor uh, combined many roles. Most emperors combine most of these roles. Some combined almost all of them. A few combined only, well, or didn't combine, just had one. Uh, but I would stress sacred monarchy. The emperor is a sacred individual. And after all, if one's asking why it is that 2,000 years ago, Western Eurasia and Eastern Eurasia both were ruled by empire, and now empire exists in East Asia but not West Europe, I think that has a lot to do with the fact that spiritual, sacred and secular power were fused in the Chinese monarchy and divided in Europe between pope and emperor, pope and, and monarch. The emperor is chief political officer. Uh, at the very least, most emperors reserve for themselves the final decisions over war, foreign policy, key uh, top-level patronage, and over matters directly concerning the survival and prosperity of the dynasty. There are exceptions. The Japanese emperors, the Abbasid, later Khal caliphs, who legitimize what are essentially the rule of military dynasties. Whether you can describe a monarch and emperor as a chief executive officer, meaning the ruler of a complex bureaucratic organization, depends obviously on whether such an organization existed. It didn't really in Europe until the 16th century. It did in China to some extent under the Han dynasty, but unequivocally by the time of the Tang and even more the Sun. The emperor is usually, at least his ancestors were, warrior kings. Of course, there is a distinction. The descendants of steppe warband leaders, the descendants of feudal monarchs, carry with them a military tradition which Buddhist and Confucian monarchy does not. Even Confucian monarchs usually reserve to themselves the last word over war and diplomacy. All sorts of things you can say about the emperor as military leader. Uh, the first thing to do is to, again, forget Machiavelli. The idea, as he puts it, that to be secure, a monarch must command his own armies, uh, is to doom any empire to disaster. An, em an emperor cannot command his key armies, and indeed the key weakness of the Roman state is precisely that any successful general uh, could think of himself as a future emperor and stage a coup d'etat. One of the things which comes across, one of the strongest things that comes across when you study Roman monarchy is the weakness of the dynastic principle. Just as at the other extreme, you have Europe, where the dynastic principle plays a bigger role than anywhere else on earth, I think, in the longer run. I can talk about that if you want, but not now. The emperor is also, to some extent, the impresario. The impresario, the chief propagandist, the chief, uh, well, obviously, the center of the imperial court, uh, with its rituals, but also its entertainments and its sociability. Uh, he is very much uh, a cultural figure. and does have to be a bit careful about this. You know, too much reading of Saint-Simon from the court of Louis XIV, too much reading of Clifford Geertz of the Theatre King can actually hide some realities. Uh, you know, even by European standards, Louis XIV was a very public monarch and the French monarchy was very public. Uh, in many non-European dynasties, the emperor would disappear into his harem for long periods. Um, probably my greatest buddy in Tokyo uh, was the head of the crown prince's household and therefore was one of that tiny group, inner group, which was given the privilege of attending the accession of the present emperor, Naruhito. The privilege actually entailed sitting on a rather uncomfortable chair outside a rather grand tent all night, 
because all the rituals were going on inside the tent between the emperor and two priests. You know, these rituals were not anything to do with projecting yourself, except in purely symbolic terms, to a public, even the narrow public of a court. The emperor was talking to the heavens, to gods, not to his subjects. Uh, so one has to be a bit careful here. And finally, of course, the emperor's dynast in all sorts of ways. Uh, managing your family was often the key to survival. Your relationship with your heir was both in one sense your pride, pride you know, the, the dynasty and the fact that your dynasty would survive uh, was part of your whole raison d'etre and the meaning of being a monarch. When Emperor Maximilian I, the Habsburgs are the extreme case, even by European standards, but when he's dying, of course, he has priests performing the services for the dying and assuring him of his place in heaven for having been a good Christian. But he also has his family genealogist reading out his genealogy all the way back to Adam and Eve. Uh, the Emperor Maximilian having bullied the faculty at the University of Vienna into validating his claim to be a direct descendant of Adam and Eve. So, you know, this also matters. All right. Um, so just a last comment and a very simple one. Emperors very often mattered a great deal. They mattered most and most regularly when it came to decisions on peace and war, on top level military and diplomatic appointments, uh, and on foreign policy. They did also, though, matter very much in crises. I think, for instance, that if not Louis XIV, but his brother-in-law, Leopold II of Austria, had ascended the French throne in 1774, there would not have been a French Revolution. Sometimes, in crisis, the top person matters hugely, then as now. In the longer term, I think the, in inverted commas, failure of the Ottomans and the success of Russia in the 18th century owes an enormous amount to superior monarchical leadership in Russia. And then you have the whole issue of religion. The choice of a religion by Emperor Constantine, fusing Christianity and the Roman Empire, to some extent Ashoka with you in India, in the 16th century with the Reformation in Europe, etc. But also, you know, the way in which the Safavid dynasty turns Iran for the first time into a Shia state. That, I think, probably remains the most important geopolitical factor in the contemporary politics of the Middle East. So I simply say again, emperors did matter. They're worth studying. Thank you. Sir, uh, uh, can you start? Hello, I finished, yes. I, I, yeah, do, I, do, not know, I, I do not know I do not know the format of the lecture. I presume that you don't have any questions or no, question answer session. You do. do. We can, uh, yes, we can. But, Hello. Uh, Hello. Can I begin by giving Chai a big hand? <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Well done, Kai. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do not know how to respond to a, a lecture which uh, travels from Europe to the Mughal India and then from one century from Roman Empire to the modern empires the massive knowledge of the speaker baffles us and or at least pretends there makes all. us very difficult <laughs> makes it makes it difficult for us to summarize the content of the lecture and which i am not going to do in any case uh, but one thing is uh, striking that there is an attempt towards a kind of a global history a monarchy and empire and things we actually studied in our own context within the limited framework of hereditary monarchies in our in, in national setting in regional setting are taken to a level where you have 
possibilities of great comparison. Mm. I am reminded of a very interesting uh, development taking place at the same time in Valois, France and Mobile India, where the ruler was actually trying to proclaim himself as the head of the church. I'm talking about Henry the third, who yeah. of course didn't succeed as much as uh, the Akbar was able to do. But then Henry the third made an attempt to create a cult of which he was the head. So such attempts by rulers across ages or across temporal spaces frequently bring out attempts towards a kind of rational decision making by men who were given the role of the leader. And the leader had to carry with him a whole range of advisors who would be able to give them the various choices from which the leader is making his choice. Yep. But then in the course of the lecture, Dominic has mentioned Kaiser Wilhelm. And I'm reminded of very interesting world by Isabel Hall, Kaiser and his entourage. I mean, Kaiser doesn't seem to be a person who is very rational. I mean, who has his own fits of anger, uh, who is uh, very who has peculiar at made choices of advisors like Wallenberg. And such things also happen. And when such things happen, when the monarchs actually fail to live up to the expectation of their advisors, their subjects, or rational behavior, when such things happen, I am reminded of a very interesting couplet from a Bengali poem. Oh Lord, O oh King, where are your clothes? And that is the inner world of the monarchy itself. The monarchy, as Dominic has very rightly suggested at the very beginning, is as much rational as it is irrational. It is as uh, capable of contributing to stability. It is capable of creating havoc. And these multiple dimensions of kingship and monarchy certainly are going to make uh, studies of state system more fruitful in future. Because all the time we have been studying revolutions, all the time we have been studying movements, it's time for us to look at the state. And for a considerable period of time, monarchy, empire, and all these institutional structures of governance dominated the state system or created the state system, controlled it, uh, created their own apparatus of empire, interacted with theories of constitution, with ideologies, ideas, political philosophy. I mean, whereas you have the whole notion of imperium on the one side, then you have over time the so-called politics of the ancient constitution as well, where the king has to engage with a whole range of ideas emerging from the attempt to establish some kind of communication between the ruler and the court on one side and the powerful men on the other side, in the countryside or in the distant provinces. So I think this is the only way that I can respond to this very, uh, very complex and a uh, very massive kind of a lecture, which has covered a lot of ground. And we are really grateful to Dominic Levin for, en for enriching us with this knowledge. And I remember my friend, uh, I, I mean, Professor Harvey Vasudevan in this context, that this lecture was perhaps the best fitting uh, contribute to the man who had given us so much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for, you know, as I say, allowing this in Harry's honor. I mean, just to respond to two or three things you said, you, you hit on a lot of the key issues. Um, I mean, one point, there is always the question, does the ruler himself or occasionally herself 
attempt to act as the ruler, to act really as the chief executive officer, to act as head of government, um, or does he or she devolve that position to something you might describe as a prime minister or, you know, a favorite, whatever you, you call it. <clears throat> and I think there are, you know, there are advantages which you can see on both sides. As a generalization, I would say that um, the most dangerous situation is when you have a man attempting to act as autocrat partly because that is what the dynastic tradition and the cultural expectation is, but being personally incapable of doing it. In other words, Louis the Sixteenth attempting to act as Louis the Fourteenth, an obvious example. I mean, one of the most fascinating aspects of this is looking at the education of heirs to an imperial monarchy. You know, this is, I mean, at a banal level, this is, of course, a key insight into that old chestnut as to whether you can actually educate leaders or whether leadership is something innate, a quality which is sort of genetic. But more interestingly, you can imagine uh, the difficulties of educating a child uh, to be an autocrat. Uh, on the shoulders, very frail shoulders of this child, uh, is the fate of dynasty and empire. Uh, when this child becomes ruler, there's not a single human being who can contradict him. Uh, there's not a single human being can tell him he's done wrong. Uh, you have absolutely got to instill into this boy or child uh, self-discipline, a sense of responsibility, uh, a commitment to something that is bigger than his own immediate ego and amusement. As emperor, this child, this young man, will have access to every luxury, vice and temptation that the world has to offer. And many people who are dangling that under his nose for their own reason. He's got to be able to resist it. No one else can control him. It's got to come from within. So you've got to, at a start, and one emperor after another says this, You've got to instill this into the child. And yet, on the other hand, uh, this child, when he's a man, has got to be a lion tamer. So there's no, you know, if you instill too much discipline in him, uh, hopeless. He'll never, ever be able to make a decision on his own. So it's actually very fascinating to watch. And one element always in rulership is that you have to, at one level or another, meet the expectations of your own elites and your own high culture. So again, all these things feed in together, and it's a, it is actually, you could write 20 fascinating books just comparing the education of heirs to the throne, which is an insight into very much the fundamental beliefs and the high culture, but also is a terribly interesting psychological study. I mean, any modern psychiatrist would go crazy. But if you imagine a child of seven who already is becoming aware that every human being more or less who approaches him is out to get something out of him to use him for their purposes every single you know minute of the day he is aware that he is something quite unlike any other human being except perhaps his father uh, modern heads of government you know, uh, who are in power for 10 years go crazy um, why is it that so many of my people remain sane and often competent? It's a sort of basic question, but quite an interesting cultural issue. Sorry, I'm going to stop chattering. Someone else probably wants to ask a question. <laughs> I, I don't know if, uh, what do you call it, the session is open for questions, but I'm sure there will be enough people who will want to ask you, uh, especially after that fascinating talk. Uh, one question that definitely does come to my mind is the case of Japan, which you've yeah. mentioned, and how... How does the emperor function in present day Japan or how have they been able to sustain this idea of emperor at a time when really a lot of that model has already been questioned everywhere? Become redundant. Yeah. I mean, yes. Yeah. Well, well, I, have, I mean, I had a question no. to add to that, Chai, which is oh, well, that... Let, let me, <laughs> if you get the time, then come back up. Uh, look, the, the thing is that the Japanese monarch has the same problem that every hereditary monarch has, plus one or two extra ones.
uh, you know, you are dealing with a political system, hereditary monarchy, which is rooted in values fundamentally antipathetic to those of the modern era. Uh, how is it that hereditary monarchy has sustained itself? Well, in the first world, the usual answer is that it's made itself less vulnerable by being obviously, or at least overtly, powerless. So even if you're, you know, on the left of the political spectrum, the usual rule is you've got something else more important you want to abolish or attack. So that is one line of analysis. Secondly, I think any old dynasty wrapped itself up in the legends and therefore in the identity of its community. And therefore, it is part of a national identity. Remember that, you know, the, the European model of the nation state, uh, which has devastated Eastern Europe, you know, two world wars, genocide and ethnic cleansing to turn Eastern Europe into the West European model. And they haven't succeeded yet. It's devastating uh, the Middle East at the moment. We're still, in some ways, fighting wars of the Ottoman succession. Uh, most of Asia is, looks more like, not empire, but looks closer to empire than it does the European model of the ethno-national state. Japan is the great exception. And that helps to explain why Japan, first among all the, the major Asian countries, made a success of European or Western-style modernity. Uh, but you've got a problem. You've got a problem in Japan, and it's, it's always there, and it's likely to become a bit worse in the role of the Japanese monarchy in the Meiji era down to 1945. I mean, the Japanese monarchy was perfect for the Meiji oligarchs. In the first place, you could carry out radical reform and radical reform which brought in Western principles and therefore appalled Japanese xenophobes or traditionalists or just most Japanese. And yet, under the guise of restoring the power of the most ancient and sacred Japanese institution, the monarchy, uh, you could cover radical, innovative, foreign-inspired reform with the patriotic, deeply national, traditional camouflage. You also had the huge advantage that for the oligarchs who feared, like most elites at that time, that democracy would lead to chaos and certainly would not do them any good, uh, the only alternative source of legitimacy in Europe and indeed in most of the world was hereditary monarchy. Uh, and the great thing about the Japanese hereditary monarchy was that it was uniquely fused with the nation in a way that the great imperial monarchies were not, couldn't but also that it had a tradition of powerlessness. So the monarch had a unique authority which legitimized oligarchical rule, but on the other hand, didn't get in the way of the oligarchs governing. And it all worked wonderfully uh, until the generation of the Meiji era, the so-called, uh, what are they called, Genro, uh, were dead. And after that, of course, the difficulties begin because the Japanese acquire their constitution from Austria and Germany, and therefore they also acquire the great problem of the German Second Reich. You, you, know, you leave enormous power in the hands of the emperor, who is the only person who can coordinate military, naval, diplomatic, and domestic policy. Even in Germany, the chancellor has no, no say as regards the army and navy. Um, it's almost impossible to be an effective hereditary emperor in a modern big state. So you have a hole at the center of government, and that is what takes Japan into the first, Second World War, loses it. Well, of course, the monarchy was very lucky to survive. Um, you know, it survived because of calculations made in Washington about its use. And on the whole, it justified uh, those calculations. But, you know, whereas every European monarch trots around in a uniform. No Japanese monarch's been seen in a uniform since 1945. Now, if you go back to really ancient tradition, that makes sense. You know, Elizabeth II of Britain or Philip VI of Spain are the descendants of pirates, essentially. War band leaders semi-civilized by the priests of one of the great salvation religions. Uh, Emperor Naruhito is the descendant of um, a shaman. You know, this, this is animist politics. But of course, that's not that easy to explain. Uh, 
you know, um, nor is it easy to, I mean, of course, they've now done it in various kinds of ways. But you know, if you think of the way that the British monarchy and subsequently all monarchies from the 19th century put on tremendous sort of popular, you know, shows. I mean, in a sense, what they're doing is what monarchs traditionally did to courts. They're making their aristocrats, or in this case, because of modern technology, the whole public, uh, not just spectators, but also almost participants in a fairy story. You know, but of course, locking my poor friend, you know, who is uh, represents that 0.0000001 percent of the Japanese population, who is allowed to watch the key accession ceremony, and even locking him out of the tent, so all he did was freeze all night, or you know, on a very uncomfortable chair, while all sorts of things happened in the tent. You know, you ha you do have your problems. You have a bigger problem now, of course, in the uh, for the last. Well, for 50 years after the Second World War, Japan was not a great power. It basically handed over all the traditional aspects of being a great power to the Americans. Well, Trump, you know, Japan is now in the front line of the confrontation which is going to dominate the world along with global warming for the next 30 years. And might God help us destroy us all. Uh, Japan's on the front line. Uh, and the dangers of being totally dependent on the United States and on the American electorate. Uh, you know, uh, were shown pretty starkly under Trump, and the Japanese elite will not forget that. Uh, but once Japan has yet, it, you know, yet again to resume some sort of independent great power role, then of course, you know, it, it's very far from being the main issue. But the role of the monarchy does become, and its historical role does become again very touchy. So I'd say, say all of those things. Tapu, what did you want to ask? I forgot. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> That's so typical, Chai, because you went into this long conversation. What do you want to ask, really? There, are, there, are, there are three questions I can see. Uh, uh, Professor Rashmi uh, Doraisumi, Shamok Ghosh, and uh, uh, Lakshmi Subramaniam. They have raised their hand. So could we have the questions in yeah. that order? The Rai Swami first, please. So, yeah. so can I ask my question, which I had was beginning to, but I I can let you go. That's right. Okay. What's happening? Should I ask my question? Yeah, yeah okay. okay. Yes, you ask my, a question, Tom. Okay. My question was really about obsolescence. Uh, yeah. If monarchy and modernity is antithetical, as you say, um, and yet monarchies survive in different ways, yeah. with greater and yeah. lesser power, uh, with yeah. symbolism and ornamentalism of different kinds. They still remain, yeah. they still remain kind of uh, important to state systems, even in the 20th century. So at which point do you feel that the obsolescence of monarchy really becomes a huge issue? So in this transition over the 20th century, uh, as you're looking at, and you mentioned the case of the German monarchy at during the Second World War. So I was going to ask you the question about redundancy and obsolescence and how you would actually track a history of that, uh, despite yeah. the fact that monarchy survive into the present. Well, I mean, again, one could talk about this forever. Um, one issue is the one I already raised. I mean, the obsolescence of monarchy becomes less salient and less crucial when the monarch is not actually any longer the key decision maker or even a major influence, uh, at least overtly on politics or at least on policy. Uh, that takes much of the heat out of it. Um, and as I say, even certainly in Britain, even radicals who dislike the monarchy can usually find something else which they dislike more or seems a higher priority in terms of getting rid of it. Not always, but often. So there's that. Then there is the fact that, you know, the, the Enlightenment and 19th century liberal conception of humanity, uh, which you find very strongly in Badgett, for instance, who was is normally cited as the great, you know, uh, prophet, supporter of modern British constitutional monarchy. And that actually isn't right. Bagot was at heart a Republican Bagot in many ways. 
but he basically thought that the mass of the population was still, to put things crudely, and of course in, in the mid-19th century you could say things you wouldn't be allowed to say today. He, he overtly said in his book that the mass of the population was incapable of thinking and could only be ruled through baubles. The monarchy was the best bauble available uh, in Britain. And it was the only way which would persuade the mass of the population to be ruled by the top 10,000 who had a brain. I mean, he damn nearly said that. In fact, he did say it. I mean, you can't say that nowadays, but the, the electorate is not rational. Uh, it does respond to symbols, to, and in many ways, perfectly acceptably when it comes to responding to symbols of the community's history and identity. Um, I think life is a lot easier for a monarch when you do have a national polity something you could describe as an ethno-national state uh, and when you have uh, you know a community with deep ethno-national link uh, you know history um so that that certainly helps then there are you know there are all the pragmatic reasons there always were uh, the basic nastiness of having elected politicians as heads of state you know, grandma prefers to go out and sort of be patted on the head by the queen than by some ridiculous, you know, former second class MP from Western Worcestershire or something. Um, you also, uh, I mean, we, we, we'll have to see, but, you know, Western Europe hasn't faced real crisis since the Second World War. In the Second World War, some of those monarchs did actually act as rallying centres, you know, in adversity. Of course, it was much dependent as always on chance. One thing which is still true in modern monarchy and always has been is um, trying to strike a balance between publicity um, so that the population can identify with you, or in the old days, to some extent, the courtiers could identify with you, and the mystery which you know, is required of monarchy even nowadays uh, if it's to sustain any of its aura. How do you both be mysterious and live the life of a celebrity under the pri you know, public eye, under the, the eye of the media? Those kind of issues still uh, are, are real. But again, you know, I think we shouldn't, we are still in our hearts, most of us anyway, we're still very Victorian. Most of us are still convinced that history is linear progress. Well, we are facing the kind of crises in the coming generation which could make all of that thinking look very foolish, even if we don't you know, have the ultimate catastrophe of uh, nuclear war, or even if global warming doesn't go to the extent that, frankly speaking, we'll go back three or four hundred years in terms of our uh, political structures. The only thing we will care about is order and security. I think even at the, in the heart of the first world, we're going to move back from what you described or move along the spectrum, at best, from what you might call the Augustan age of liberty for elites uh, to the Diocletian security state era. Uh, and it could be a lot worse. So, I mean, you know, I, I take nothing for granted in terms of progress or modernity or obsolescence. Mm -hmm. There were lots of questions. Someone said there were lots of questions. Yeah, uh, uh, was that the right uh, Thank you, Professor Lieben. Uh, uh, I was fascinated by a term you used, imperial scale, in with regard to those four pillars. Yeah. Uh, you also referred to Catherine the Great and to Wu Zetian, uh, the Chinese Empress. Yeah. Uh, uh, these two women really uh, fit into only two of the pillars, uh, two of the four pillars that you mentioned. Uh, they were not hereditary monarchs. Uh, they came into monarchy through their own agencies. And uh, I was just wondering if imperial scale uh, could be uh, kind of expanded to uh, see the kind of, to analyze the kind of um, effects that they uh, unleashed in a sense. If you look at Catherine the Great, uh, she, unlike Peter the Great, did not open a window onto Europe, but she invited Europe in a sense, the Germans into Russia. Um, the great migrations of the Germans into Russia and the afterlife of which we see even in the 20th century, we see Stalin um, 
and and his uh, you know his um, suspicion of the germans who had settled uh, in russia pre and during the second world war so i mean i mean i'm just looking at the way imperial scale can work with wu zitan it is uh, the way she used uh, so sorry who was the second person you were saying uh wu zitan the, the chinese empress who oh, was a chan who was a chan yes 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 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, the way she used a uh, foreign religion she made buddhism the official religion and uh, so this is uh, in a sense you know the migration of ideas or the migration yeah. of yeah. people that was used for imperial scale quite apart from the fact that both these empresses actually physically uh, extended their empires uh, but this is you know uh, at a more abstract level the use of imperial scale uh, through um, you know different kinds of migrations i, I was just fascinated by this uh, term that you proposed sure. Sure. No, thank you very much. That's very interesting. W w when I use the words imperial scale, I try to keep that for reasons just of clarity to geography, meaning that you know if you're dealing with pre-modern communications, it is almost unimaginably difficult to to, to govern these vast land areas. So it always amazes me. I mean, they do fall to bits. They regularly fall to bits. But what amazes me is not that they fall to bits, but that they hold together at all. Um, and there are all sorts of fascinating elements in this. And one of them is certainly, I think, that probably the most important principle in any empire to keep it going is a solid alliance between the, mon the monarch and, to some extent, if, you could, if it exists already, the central monarchical state and the provincial elite. Because, I mean, if you look at the first Chinese emperor and the Qin, you know, tradition of, st of, of statehood, um, it's simply, you sim I mean, it, there were enormous problems, operational costs, even when you were governing the, the Qin kingdom. When you were tempted to apply that bureaucratic centralizing principle to an empire, it just, it, it just disintegrated. I mean, there were more immediate reasons for disintegration, such as a succession struggle. But, but before you got, I mean, you know, behind that, there is this basic problem. You can only really govern something like an empire in, with pre-modern communications through some sort of stable alliance <coughs> with elites, particularly landowning elites. Uh, and that is easier said than done. Uh, and it requires both common material benefit and the kind of common cultural and often religious solidarity. Uh, that the great imperial systems breed. The court is a splendid way of bringing together the top elites uh, with the monarch uh, in all sorts of different aspects. So that, you know, that is imperial scale for me. I keep it in that relatively narrow geographical box in order not to confuse myself. But when I'm talking, I, I include much of what you're talking about in terms of power because I think of it in terms of cultural power. Uh, one of the great things about empire is that, you know, it will often welcome uh, ethno-linguistic, even cultural diversity. Uh, partly, of course, it's in the interests of the emperor to do so. He plays off one against t'other. Um, and the Baltic Germans in the Russian empire were a very useful way in which the Tsar was less dependent on the Russian aristocracy and its networks didn't always work uh, but um, it, it, it's also of course uh, helps his status king of kings lord of lords you know that is very much I mean that's what you're talking about in a way it's extent it's scale but it's above all scale in the mind you know I mean the two are always linked you know we have minds and we have toes we, we couldn't do without either and the same is true of the, these kind of concepts um, I mean, I inevitably thought, I mean, I thought of Wu Zetian and Catherine as comparisons above all of female monarchs. Uh, and there is a, a lot of very fascinating things you can say about females occupying, you know, the top position in deeply male dominated societies uh, and how it's done. Um, they're both very, very fascinating human beings. But <clears throat> yes, I mean, Catherine, 
carries forward what Peter and even to some extent Alexei Mikhailovich had done, bringing in foreigners. Uh, and now, of course, you know, like a rabbit, I'm heading off in a diversion. But you know, the Ru the Russian Ottoman comparison is a very interesting one. Uh, the way in which the Janissaries stop modernization in the Ottoman Empire and their equivalents, the Streltsy in Moscow, are bumped off by Peter the Great. It's fascinating. How does Peter do it? In part because he has foreign regiments with whom he is, with whose commanders he's been in close contact since he was an adolescent as part of his whole personal opening to the West. And it's those foreign regiments, and particularly their commander, Patrick Gordon, who crush the revolt of the Streltsy and stop Russian westernization, if you want to be called that, um, being blocked by the same kind of forces that the Janissary and religious conservatism impose on modernizing change in the 18th century Ottoman Empire. So you get, you know, there are all sorts of ins and outs of this. Um, Wu Zetian and Buddhism, yes, but in a way wisely and in, in a manner which is not that dissimilar from Catherine. Yes, Catherine invites in all sorts of Westerners. Yes, her aim is for Russia to become in the full sense a European country. But she is enormously careful to cultivate the Orthodox Church, for instance. She doesn't believe a word of Orthodox religion, um, but she goes through all the rituals and the appointments process and the visits with extreme care, dignity, you name it. Uh, and she is very careful to position herself in the tradition of Peter, not just as Western, Westernizer, but also as a monarch who is making Russia a European great power. And to that, the elites, with that, the elites can completely identify. So she's playing the two, and so is Wu Zetian. So is Wu Zetian, yes. Um, for all sorts of reasons, uh, and in a way which one finds, you know, earlier Chinese emperors had sometimes done, and one can find obviously Southeast Asian emperors as well. She is a great patroness of Buddhism. Um, and I think it's fair to say that there is an element there that, I mean, B Buddhism certainly offers more to a woman than Confucianism, I think. I, I think it actually offers more to, I mean, Confucianism is a bit like Stoicism and Marcus Aurelius. Uh, you know, Buddhism touches the parts, the inner parts that Confucianism can't, and Stoicism certainly couldn't, which is why Marcus Aurelius was so miserable most of his life. You know, duty is not enough uh, to carry you through the burdens of ordinary life, let alone ruling an empire. Um, so, so there are aspects of this, but I mean, Wu Zetian never completely goes over to Buddhism. And after all, for both personal and political reasons, uh, especially in her last years, she is rowing back somewhat, partly, of course, because however much sacred monarchy needs the alliance with some version of priesthood, it also hates the idea that priesthood runs off with more and more of the community's resources. So there's that tension, you know, which you can see. But there's also, in a purely personal sense, um, she does retain many deep Confucian allegiances. For instance, you know, the issue is whether she's actually going to carry out her initial step to put her own family, to establish her own dynasty, her own family, and push the, the tongue aside. The problem about that is that it means making her nephews her heirs, not her sons. Well, her nephews, by Confucian tradition, can't look after her mausoleum, where she's buried. And that means she's not going to have her own version of the afterlife. This really matters to her. I don't, I suppose, I don't know if any of you have ever read the novels of a character called Van Gulik. Judge D, mean anything to you? He was the Dutch ambassador in Peking in the early years of the communist regime, sort of earlier period. But he also was a great sinologist, spoke you know, read fluent Chinese and wrote these novels about uh, a Chinese magistrate under the early Tang, including in Empress Wu Zetian's era. Well, he was, he actually, he was a historical figure and he became her prime minister. And it was he who persuaded her that actually, you know, it was great being empress, but that actually she should restore the Tang dynasty um, to succeed her in the persons of her sons. And he did that 
he himself was a legitimist. He himself was a Tang loyalist. And he pushed that argument too, that the Tang dynasty had a legitimacy which her nephews could never have. But he also very much and very craftily stressed her own fears of not having an afterlife. Um, if you know her sons were not there to, to look after her, her grave. Um, so you get, you know, there are endless ins and outs of all of this. I think, you know, an obvious, an, an obvious issue and one which comes across a lot and has grand scale implications, which you, you can't answer the question, but it's interesting to ask. I mean, Buddhism and Confucianism are in the nature of things, less monopolistic, less in inverted commas selfish the monotheism, monotheism. Uh, and so the Chinese imperial tradition can merge and the Buddhist tradition can merge with other religions in a way that Christianity or Islam finds impossible. They may tolerate other religions but they can't merge with them. Uh, and so I mean the you know the great Qing emperors, my heroes, I sort of I, I live in my study surrounded by, I have a great collection of matryoshka dolls including Emperor Akbar and Austro-Hungarians, of course, lots of Russians. But I also have the Qing dynasty, Yongzheng and Kangxi. Well, Kangxi and Yongzheng, who are, of course, Manchu, they're Manchurians. They're, they're not quite nomads, but they're semi-nomads. Well, they pass themselves across. What are they? In, in multiple guises, they legitimize themselves. They're Confucian monarchs. And, and they are completely credible Confucian monarchs. They've been brought up you know, in a, in a really deep and, and sincere and often, you know, extremely cultured understanding of Chinese civilization. So they're Confucian monarchs. They are also very much Manchu shaman monarchs. But they're Lamaistic Buddhist monarchs when they're um, facing out towards Tibet. And they give tremendous patronage to Yongzheng in particular, to Lamaistic Buddhism. But they also carry out Mongolian shamanistic rituals and marry above all into, well, they marry their daughters into Mongolian princely dynasties. You know, Queen Victoria may have loved her Indian servants, but she never proclaimed herself a Muslim or a Hindu. She couldn't. And in that sense, you could argue that the great, you know, Asian uh, imperial monarchies, uh, which are precisely not rooted in monotheism, are actually in a way more interesting forebearers. Uh, to contemporary society, particularly to contemporary multi-ethnic society um, and to multi-ethnic polities than the European or Islamic tradition. Uh, and dear Akbar, who's almost my hero among all emperors, I mean, you know, the imagination simply boggles when you, you have to cope with someone like him. But after all, he is attempting to set himself up as some kind of mixture of the head of a Sufi brotherhood, um, uh, a, a monarch in the imperial Persian tradition, and yet someone who will also, in many ways, you know, respond to Hindu and Sanskrit tradition. Uh, not to mention someone who loves having arguments with Jesuits and annoys them just as much as he annoys Muslim, you know, ulema. Because, of course, he's not a monotheist any longer. Uh, so you get all sorts of... Sorry, I've wandered right away. But uh, you get all sorts of variations on this thing. The one thing to grasp is that these people thought big. You know, Catherine thought big, Wu Zetian thought big, Akbar thought big. These were not little kings, you know. Um, they did think of themselves as the sort of bearers of a great, potentially universal religion and culture. And Akbar's wonderful as well, in the sense that he, he does think that, but he also has an enormous respect for other quite alien cultural traditions, you know, which you see in his patronage of painting where after all he really is, you know, merging Persian and Sanskrit and, and European artistic styles. And not just merging them for fun, but because he really appreciates them. Sorry, that went on too long. Well, what was Chai? the next question? Can you hear me, Chai? I can hear you, yeah. Who is it? Oh, I, it's Tom here. Hello, Tom, yeah. I can't I see was... you, but I can hear you. Uh, you look a little oh. bit like a moon moon with a halo around you. Well, let me see. I'm not sure I can do much about that. Well, don't worry. It's probably the Welsh well, I'm not, I, I, As long as I'm not looking like a mouse. Or... No, you're not looking like a mouse. That's Far right. ahead, Tom. Uh, uh, no, I was just thinking of the words which uh, Gore Vidal put into the mouth of uh, King David when he wrote the biography of him. I built an empire the size of Maine. But you probably wouldn't endorse that. 
I, I built an empire the size of where? Of Maine. Maine. What, you mean that tiny place in the USA? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, slightly more seriously, yeah, yeah, yeah. empires can create systems. Uh, the only system I can think of which tried to create empires was, I think it was called the Tetrarchy, wasn't it? Yes. In the sort of late Roman period. Yes. Two Caesars and two Augusti. And it's not just, presumably, because they've got so much territory to cover, because even within both East and West, there was, there was a junior emperor and yep. a senior emperor. Yeah. That's the only occasion on which I can think that anything like that's ever been tried. It is, and it's a fascinating one, and it does actually feature quite significantly in my chapter on Rome. I mean, yes. it's an attempt to solve two issues, and the two issues which really, in the end, destroy the Roman Empire. One of them is the fact that this is an empire which is fighting on two fronts, two different enemies. The Persian enemy, the real great power enemy, the biggest threat, and then the growing power of the Germanic tribes and the tribes beyond them coming in from, uh, you know, the Asian steppe and confederating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once by the fourth century, particularly the second half of the, well, no, the fourth century as a whole, uh, you, you, you get a simultaneous pressure on both military fronts, Western and Eastern. Um, you're in a position where you can't, obviously, the emperor can't lead his armies in both theatres. The theatres are too far apart. It takes a year to get reinforcements from one to the other. You're also in a situation whereby if you put anyone, any general in, the supreme commander on the Western Front, while you're in the East or vice versa, there's a huge threat that he'll stage a coup and try and overthrow you. <clears throat> on top of that, you have the problem of succession, which is a nightmare in the Roman Empire because of the weakness of the dynastic principle. Well, Diocletian tries to kill two birds with one stone uh, by setting up an emperor in the East and an emperor in the West, an Augustus, with a sort of deputy emperor, a Caesar, in both areas. And the idea is, of course, the Augusti retire, the Caesars take over, and then the next generation, you know, the, 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 the new Augusti appoints Caesars. Um, and it all is wonderful, uh, except that it isn't. Because, uh, you know, on the one hand, dynasticism is weak in the Roman monarchy. On the other hand, the principle that son succeeds father, if the father has an adult son, is very powerful. So when you try and go over to a system which says that the father doesn't appoint his adult son as heir, you're running against very, very deep-rooted values. And you're also inevitably annoying your son no end. Uh, there's a strong argument that Diocletian only did this because he didn't have a son of his own. Uh, that may or may not be right, I don't know, but it, it's certainly plausible. Um, and the whole thing falls to bits. I mean, in the end, you can argue the Roman Empire would have fallen to bits between its Greek and its Latin halves. You can argue that it wouldn't, um, but for, in other words, for deep cultural reasons. But in, in the immediate run, it fell to bits over a geopolitical issue. Um, you couldn't command in the East and the West simultaneously. Uh, the Tetrarchy as a system for keeping the whole empire together under two emperors failed. Uh, and in the end, the weaker and less important part of the empire, the western half, just couldn't generate the power to keep the external enemy at bay. I mean, it's as simple as that. I think Piren was right. I mean, it's the 7th century, which is the real break, not the fall of the western empire. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, can I ask a question? The of course, yeah. Yes, oh, please. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, it, it was a very exciting talk. Uh, thank you for the talk, Professor Levin. Thank you. Um, um, so I have a two-part question, and um, it has to do with uh, the comparative scale uh, in which you are thinking uh, yeah. in the talk and in your project. The first question, and uh, I think I missed like 15 minutes of the talk. Uh, uh, the first part. I'm not sure if you have addressed this, but we are talking about women. We are talking about um, you know women's power, women rulers in the harem and the court, and things alike. So one way to look at the history of the court is to um, think about increased, uh, you know, the increasing conventions and norms within the court that make it a court, right? If we were to talk about courtization as a process, we will see 
um, you know, be it the Umayyads, be it the Abbasids, the Fatimids, down to the Safavids, Mughals, there is an increasing, uh, you know, conventions and norms become tremendously important, right? Even with uh, the Ottomans. So I was thinking, you know, um, women who are performing within these uh, conventions and norms of the court, right? And uh, how can we talk about their power, right? How can we talk about agency and power and, you know, women in positions of power when it is within these conventions and norms? The second sure. question uh, that I have is to do with, um, you know, because of this, because of this fantastic scope and scale of your work, I was reminded of Salins's work, uh, Marshall Salins's work. Yeah, on yeah, yeah. Right. And yeah. um, I was wondering because Salins, um, his approach is slightly different, but yeah. particularly because of the category he's using, king. Yeah. Right. And so there is this whole literature on kings. And then we have emperors and monarchs yeah. and yeah. rulers. So I, I, I just wanted to kind of um, know why you use emperors and look at history through emperors and you know like because not kings or kingship but emperors yeah. and monarchy right yeah. so that is the second yeah. question okay like. well let me answer the second question first on two levels um the the one i'll obviously the serious one is the the academic intellectual level the possibly truer and certainly more human one is that, you know, at the age of four, I had a very, very kindly English nanny who lived with us for 25 years. And the, the basic way I kept her in order was by taking her off to look at the King Cobra in the Natural History Museum, which terrified her. Every time she annoyed me, I would insist on going to visit the King Cobra. And I think I had a particular love for the King Cobra. I wasn't prepared to, you know, slum with ordinary cobras. And I suspect that somewhere along the line, emperors, not kings, is just snobbery or something deep inside. It is also, of course, to do with the fact that most of my academic life has been devoted to the study of an empire, Russia, or empires in general. I wrote this sort of book. But I mean, you know, that's obviously the silly uh, aspect of this. I mean, emperors are, to some extent, you know, they are cobras and king cobras. They have much of... Uh, to use a horrible modern word, the DNA of, of a king. They're monarchs, they're hereditary monarchs. Most of what I say could be applied to hereditary kings. But, um, you know, there is a difference. It, there's a difference, obviously, in terms of the resources they have. You know, I mean, whether you call Louis XIV a king or an emperor is in some ways unimportant. It's the fact, it's what he can do. You know, an emperor has resources on a scale to build fantastic buildings, monuments, huge collections of art. I mean, some kings can do it, but, you know, not not most. Uh, so there's that, the obvious. Then there's the whole issue of power um, in the more obvious sense of military power, etc., etc. But there's also something up there in the mind. Uh, you know, you are a very different person when instead of trotting round on the Anatolian steppe, as essentially a glorified, well, tribal is the wrong word, glorified warband leader. When you're sitting in Constantinople and you can see the Roman and Byzantine heritage in front of you, and more important, when you have in your imagination everything that Constantinople, the Roman Byzantine Empire has meant almost for a millennium, even to Muslims, let alone to the broader Middle Eastern Persian civilization, that makes you a rather different kind of human being, uh, I think, to your ordinary little monarch. Um, you still have, as I say, many of the attributes of, a, of an ordinary monarch, but there is something different. And I think both in inverted commas in reality, but more interestingly in the imagination as well. That would be I could say an awful lot more, but I won't. Um, the second point about the court. Yeah, yes, indeed. Look, I mean, at a, what you say is classically true of most of the monarchies I study, in the sense that, you know, many, possibly most, of these dynasties to which I devote chapters started off as warband leaders, 
usually originating, if you go back far enough, on the Eurasian steppe. And monarchy, you know, as it emerges from leading a war band, is a pretty down-to-earth, unceremonial business. I mean, the most depressing monarchs on earth are the leaders of German war bands uh, in the late Roman, early Dark Ages, in inverted commas, era. You know, was, they had the lifespan of a sort of modern English Premier League manager. Um, you were monarch, you were basically, you were a war band leader, and if you lost the war, that was it, mate. Even poor Arminius, you know, who is sort of famous in Germany for the Teutonberger Wald, uh, 989 CE, um, gets bumped off and deposed. Uh, so, you know, you start there, but of course, as you take over great sedentary cultures and civilizations and dynastic traditions, and you begin to associate with them, and you try and rise above, your war band while keeping it loyal at the same time, which is itself an interesting balance. Um, increasingly, you take on a more remote, a more ceremonial, a more ritual. And, and the key then is not to be taken over by it entirely. I mean, you know, lots of elites the world over have longed to turn their monarch into a totem pole, you know, uh, some kind of ritual center, uh, some kind of source of legitimacy which will not be able to exercise great discipline over them. Um, so dynasties which last, uh, in a sense, have to hold that balance. They need to rise way above being a pure war band leader. They need to acquire some of the sacredness, uh, which, you know, is there in court ceremony, um, but also some of the skills of the impresario running a court. Uh, which retains some of the elements of being a war band leader, but camaraderie, this and that, but at a much more exalted and different, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. Um, but at the same time, they need to retain their real power. It's, you know, it, this is politics as art, and people like Louis XIV, or, or I mean, Akbar and that lot, or indeed some of the Chinese emperors, um, a lot of them, you know, they manage it in brilliant fashion they are brilliant politicians um which is more than you can really hope for from hereditary monarchs though some of them uh you know particularly if you're not dealing with europe where you, you know, in other words you're in systems where you don't have strict male primogeniture they have had to get there partly through their own efforts they couldn't have been there without the blood but they, the blood was not enough so i mean that in a confused kind of way is an answer don't say the other thing i would actually stress is that never, ever forget, I, I said this a thing, but in most pre-modern systems, and therefore by definition, in most monarchies, and certainly in imperial monarchies too, patronage matters at least as much as policy. You know, uh, at least as much, in fact, probably. It, patronage always matters, policy sometimes does. Um. Professor Lakshmi Subramaniam had a question. Uh, yes. Ma'am, uh, can you ask that? Or is your connection still bad? Lakshmi, can you ask the question? Shall I ask? I think Lakshmi. I don't know, is she still on? I think yeah, she was, but her uh, uh, Wi Fi is. Causing a problem. Okay. Oh, okay. Then I think you should go ahead, King Shubha, and ask the question because we don't see her on the list uh, currently. So yeah. Okay. So let me just uh, let me just go back to her message, which has the question. I'll read it. Yeah, Professor Lakshmi Subramaniam was curious about the education of princes. Right yeah. through the 17th and 18th century of the Enlightenment in particular, um, because she asks, does this engage with the other discourse which was emerging of civility and social regulation and education for a nascent civil society? Or would you say, do the two dom domains remain apart? No, it doesn't remain apart at all. Um, you know, it's actually very fascinating looking at the way in which 18th century princes, heirs, uh, 
are educated and the way it reflects shifting currents in the Enlightenment. Uh, you know, Louis XIV is a model for 50, 60 years, then Frederick II becomes a model in many ways for many monarchs, including to the horror of Maria Theresa, um, for her son and heir, Joseph II. Um, of course, the Enlightenment comes in shapes and sizes. The German Enlightenment is not the French Enlightenment. And the, the Enlightenment, as it is taught to, you know, the Tsarevich Alexander in Russia, is already the Enlightenment of the 17, you know, 80s, uh, um, a late Enlightenment, um, which, you know, obviously is the heir in many ways with La Harpe of what had gone earlier, but has certain very specific variants. So it's a complicated one, but in many, many cases, the tutors explicitly stress that, that what they are doing um, is trying to educate a man who will see himself as the first citizen of his polity, who will take Marcus Aurelius, I mean, this is certainly La Harpe to Alexander I, who will take Marcus Aurelius as his model, uh, the monarch who always claimed that he would have restored the Republic if Romans were capable of sustaining Republicanism. And after all, this suits Russia perfectly in the sense that, uh, you know, here is Alexander I being brought up as heir on good old semi-Republican Enlightenment principles in not just uh, an autocracy, but in an autocracy deeply rooted in a rather nasty version of serfdom. Uh, so all, all of this is there, all right. And indeed, of course, the later critics stress that this education was, in a sense, destructive. Uh, because, you know, in the light of the French Revolution, they argued that turning the monarch into the first citizen, or even worse, the first civil servant of the state, uh, was to denigrate the monarchy, reduce its prestige, reduce its legitimacy, and its appeal, you know, to a world which they saw as being non-rational, apart from anything else, and also deeply hierarchical, of course. They saw these Enlightenment monarchs as undermining uh, the principles on which hereditary monarchy itself was built, which after all was what many of the conservative critics of the policies of Joseph II, uh, you know, said to him ex explicitly in the 1780s. So, I mean, it's it's all there, but it's also part of a broader uh, question of um, the way in which heirs to a throne are almost necessarily brought up uh, to reflect the elite values of their era, and if their parents are intelligent, often the most enlightened or the most, you know, the, the, the thinkers and the values which dominate uh, uh, the elites of the cultural as well as the sort of social elites of the era. You know, a medieval English king or French king needed to be able to joust. Otherwise, he was regarded as a softy. And he didn't pay to be re regarded as a softy by sort of feudal warrior aristocrats. In the same way, you know, in the 18th century, it was simply not respectable to have a monarch um, who hadn't read, you know, had no idea of classical civilization, spoke one language. I mean, it, it, it's happened, but it certainly didn't contribute to the monarch's prestige or his ability to maneuver himself within the elites and the vested interests in his state. Again, I could go on for a long time. I mean, it's all educations, even though now, I mean, again, all educations of princes begin in the 18th century with the fundamental Christian uh, principles, you know, which are regarded as being the foundation. Uh, well, they're, apart from that, they're regarded as being the foundation for any kind of ethical existence. And the great fear with a monarch is that if he hasn't any sense of ethics and responsibility, he'll blow up the community, as indeed he could. Probably, oh, yeah, I think I, I won't say anything more on that because I could go on for too long on this one. It's a subject which rather fascinates me. I was just wondering, uh, in the, after two hours, have you warmed up a little? Yes, yes. I've warmed up considerably. It's naught degrees in London outside and I've got two heaters blowing at me. <laughs> Good. Uh, Tabadidi, would you have uh, something more there? Because we are towards the end of this thing. So once you are done, um, the head of the department, Ritika Vishash, will um yeah uh, uh, is still there i hope so uh you would uh, offer a vote of thanks after the um, finishes well, well i'm uh, i'm completely i haven't got anything i want to add but i'm perfectly happy to answer if someone else is
desperate to ask something, I'm perfectly willing to answer it. So it's up to you. I just really wanted to hold up uh, Hari's copy of Chaya's book. Oh, yes, Empire. Empire yes, yes. Which yeah. is inscribed by Chai. I just thought for everybody to see. For Hari, Chai Lieben, May 2001. Uh, but among, Didn't I draw in it, Tapu? Didn't I draw an elephant or a Cossack? No, you didn't quite draw. Oh, yes, well, I was on my best behavior then. No, no, I, no, 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 right. yeah. so, I, was, I was younger and more solemn in those days. Uh, so, Chai's family history connects him, his bio tells us, to a surprising range of empires. And I think Hari and I would never cease to be amused by this family history. Uh, <laughs> I belong to a different era, and that's why I asked the question too. But he has been a steadfast friend. And I want to say, of course, to Hari, they, they go back to Christ College. But when I arrived in England uh, as a person who had never gone abroad before, my first stop in London was Chai's home. Uh, Hari picked me up and from Heathrow. And before we went to Oxford, uh, he took me to Notting Hill Gate, where I lived. It was the most amazing house where there were books at every corner. And the whole night, I thought the books could be collapsing on me at any time. <laughs> I climbed up to a point. I'd never seen such glorious disorder. Uh, <laughs> it's much Hari, worse now, Tapu. I'm sure it is. I thought Hari's. You could not get worse in terms of <laughs> books piling, piling, piling till they were going to descend on you. And then I saw Chai's home and I said, I know where this is coming from. And we spent some of the most wonderful times together. Uh, I remember wanting to go to Trafalgar Square yes, on my first Christmas and New Year in London. And Chai refused to let me go said they'll throw you into the pool and the fountain and there's no way I can let you go. And that was <laughs> the beginning of a very long friendship. Uh, I'm deeply, deeply grateful to you on behalf of the Department of History, but of course on behalf of family and friends for giving a truly remarkable and entertaining, as always, but also really erudite lecture. Uh, and. I think just on behalf of Rinalini and me, today I shared with Chai a picture of Hari and Chai in Cambridge with the two little girls, Rinalini and Chai's daughter, Alaka. We have to tell you that Chai's children are all named after emperors and empresses. His son's called Maxi after Maximilian and his <laughs> daughter is Alexandra. So truly it runs in the family. Thank you again, Chai. And I think Hari would be truly, truly happy and honored that you gave the first lecture for him. I just Thank like to Tapu. add. Thank you, Tapu. But I, he wouldn't be, uh, I hope he wouldn't be honored. Uh, I hope he would regard it as a, a very, very small gesture from someone who was deeply, deeply fond of him uh, and who misses him enormously. Not as much as you do uh, or as Ravi and Radhika do, but does miss him enormously. I just like to add, I think the best of uh, lectures are like just good stories that somebody tells you. And this felt like a great storytelling session. Otherwise, I don't think we'd all have, you know, sat so riveted for all, like close to two hours. So this was really the best form of telling us about a subject. And thank you so much. I hope we can meet whenever times are God better willing. to actually do yeah. to come to India. So, yeah. God willing. God willing. Yeah. God willing. God willing. Yeah. It's, I, I see many friends I mean, float in and off the screen, so I'd like um, to say hello to uh, all of you. Anyway, uh, Bhaskar Babu has uh, had to leave, so oh. if you could wind up the day's session. Okay, okay. Uh, actually, uh, I don't think uh, that a memorial lecture could need any formal vote of names because we are we generally guided. Uh, not merely academic persuasion, but also of our emotional attachment to the person. I, I'm finding it very so difficult to hear, I'm afraid. 
I think I can hear that. I can hear, no, I can hear music. Audible now? I can hear just, yes. Okay. okay. Actually, uh, what I uh, told earlier that uh, this kind of a lecture, a memorial lecture, may not need a formal vote of thanks because we gather here not merely out of our academic art, but also out of our emotional attachment to the person in whose memory such a lecture is dedicated to. But uh, of course, I express my heartfelt gratitude to the entire community, the and international community we have today. And while uh, listening to this lecture, I was wondering that I, I had actually a mixed feeling. I, uh, I was feeling inwardly somewhat unfortunate that we could not organize a seminar like this in our department, where our SAD is still a very living phenomenon. But at the same time, I felt that this pandemic has devastated our life in so many ways, but it also created a different kind of forum for us. Probably in a normal situation, we could not arrange for such a gathering with people from different parts of the world coming on a common platform. In our uh, very, very uh, limited infrastructural facilities, we could not organize it in our department. So I'm really, really, really grateful to all of you that actually our sir who was definitely an international man deserve this kind of a gathering in a, yes, a yes, seminar yes, and yes, uh, yes, and his uh, the first memorial lecture in uh, honor of our sir of course this uh, it, it required this kind of a uh, lecture this, uh, it deserved this kind of a gathering that is all i can say with my one uh, my expressing my uh, heartfelt gratitude to everyone Thank you all. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. I hope to see you all when I...